the Persians had been expanding their empire at a fast pace. They had forced the Greek cities on the coast of Asia into submission, and when the Greeks revolted, the Persians conquered them by force of arms, and went even further, conquering Thrace and subjugating Macedonia, defeating anyone who would dare to resist. Two Greek city-states, Athens and Eritrea, had been active against the Persians at this time, and the Persian king now sought revenge. He amassed a fleet of 600 triremes and sent it into Greece under the command of an admiral named Datis and a nobleman who had contacts in Athens named Artaphernes. The Persians' first target were the Cyclades islands and particularly Naxos that had resisted Persian rule. They sacked Naxos and took its citizens into slavery. Next, the Persians forced Charistos into submission and attacked Eritrea. Eritrea was sacked, and its citizens were also taken into slavery. The third target of the Persian campaign was Athens. This time, however, the Persians sailed up to the Bay of Marathon, anchored their fleet there, and for several days did nothing. Their inactivity has been something of a historical mystery. What was going on here? The Persian campaign had taken place in the summer, and by July strong winds began to blow across the Aegean and go on until late August. These winds are especially strong in the area between Eritrea and Attica. The Bay of Marathon is well protected from these winds and it is large enough to provide shelter to hundreds of ships. There is simply no other place between Eritrea and Attica that affords such protection. Perhaps the Persians landed on Attica not to attack Athens, at least not immediately, but only to find shelter from the harrowing winds. And while there, perhaps they hope to get some intelligence about the situation in Athens through their agents. So they were probably surprised to find one fair day the entire army of Athens arrayed for battle on the high ground. Every Athenian who could bear arms had marched out and the town of Plataea had also sent out its armed citizens. Together, the Greeks had 10,000 hoplites and also some slaves who had been promised their freedom if they would fight for Athens. The Athenians sent a runner to Sparta to ask for help. The runner, Phidippides, whose name means a man who does not need a horse, ran the 250 kilometers to Sparta in a day. The Spartans listened to him and promised to march to the aid of the Athenians, but only once their religious festival dedicated to the god Apollo was over. Religious and athletic festivals were taken very seriously in ancient Greece, and it was sacrilege to go to war during such a festival. Here is the Bay of Marathon today as seen in Google Earth. And here is the situation with the Persian fleet anchored in the bay, the Persian army encamped on the coast, and the Athenians encamped on the high ground near the village of Marathon by the sacred grove of Heracles. The Athenians and the Persians made sacrifices and asked for omens, but the omens were not favorable. Both sides consider their position. The Athenians had checkmated the Persians. They held the main road to Athens, which is the one here on the left going west, and their position flanked the other road, the coastal road. They held the high ground. The Persians, who had perhaps only sought reprieve from the harrowing August winds, had not bargained on having the Athenians overlooking their camp in the Bay of Marathon. 
they could neither march off at his, nor take to their ships without inviting an attack from the Athenians. Why they lingered on uncomfortably under the gaze of the Athenian army, they must have considered their options. One was to attack, but the Athenians had amassed a great host, and a frontal uphill attack would be risky. Another option was to sail to Athens, if their agents in Athens could only open the gates. But to sail to Athens they would have to sail around Cape Sunion, a full day's journey. By then the Athenians could perhaps march back through the much shorter overland route and get to Athens first. Then there was the problem of the Spartans coming over in a few days' time to aid the Athenians. What seems to have happened was that, after several days of a tense face-off, the Persians pulled out some of their ships to sea and perhaps made a show of embarking some of their men. Now among the Athenian generals was one named Imbaltiades. He was the son of a famous Olympic champion and a war veteran himself who was familiar with the battle tactics of the Persians. Herodotus tells us that Miltiades was confident of victory and that he was so much respected that all other generals deferred to him. Whether this move of the Persians was a ruse or not, Miltiades could not wait for the Spartans to arrive. He immediately asked the permission of the war council to attack. The Athenian war council was divided, but the commander-in-chief, a general named Callimachus, sided with Miltiades. There was no time to waste. Miltiades gave battle orders. The hoplite phalanx started marching down the hillside, spreading out as it did to match the width of the Persian army that began to deploy in the plain below, and in so doing the central phalanx had to reduce the depth of its ranks to just a few men, but the wings remained eight ranks deep or more. Some think this was a clever plan of Miltiades, some kind of stratagem, aiming at a double envelopment, or at refusing the centre and such, but it may have only been done out of necessity to match the front of the Persian army. At this period in Greek history, strategic thinking differed from that of modern armchair generals. War between the Greek city-states was rather like a sport, and was governed by rules. All men had the same armour and the same primary weapon, a spear. Using a bow was cheating. It was the weapon of dishonor. A sword could be used as a last resort, but it was frowned upon because one might use a sword to maim an opponent, which was seen as an underhand tactic. Even hacking at the dead was regarded dishonorable. Using a horse, of course, took cheating to quite another level, Although at this time the Thebans had started introducing cavalry, no other city-state was willing to bend the rules by this much. On the other hand, to win in a battle where all combatants had exactly the same armament, one needed courage, a good drilling in the rules of fighting in a phalanx, honour and a good discipline that came from continual practising. There was another crucial difference between the two armies opposed at Marathon. The Greeks were heavily armoured in bronze and iron, whereas the Persians had little armour other than their shields, and these were sometimes wooden shields and other times wicked shields made of interwoven grass. Why did anyone think that a shield made of woven grass was a good idea? The hoplite armour, of course, was much heavier, which could be something of a handicap. But the Greeks made a sport out of racing in armour, and on this occasion they would even be racing downhill.
once the phalanx was within range of the Persian archers. Multiades ordered the men to charge downhill into the enemy. The collision would have been devastating. The momentum of the downhill charge and the full weight of the bronze armor of the Hoplites would have sent a shock through the Persian battle line. Thrown off balanced and pushed back, the Persians panicked, especially on the flanks. Indeed, there is a legend behind it as panic was a type of fear caused by the god Pan. And it was said that when Pheidippides had been on his mission to Sparta, he encountered the god Pan on his way, and the god promised to spread fear among the Persians at the battle if the Athenians would, in exchange, build a shrine to him. So the wings of the Persian army started to give in, as the center was still holding. We are even being told that the thin line at the center of the Athenian battle line was about to break when the Persian wings gave in. What followed is a foregone conclusion. Those that panicked and ran back caused panic among those following behind, and mats of the Persian army probably went into disarray.
The Persians ran for their ships, those who could, and the ships sailed off, leaving many behind. The Athenians lost a hundred and ninety-two of their citizens, among them the general in command, Callimachus. This sounds like a small number. It was reported by Herodotus, and when the tomb of the fallen Athenians was excavated, indeed the bones of a hundred and ninety-two men were found there. Several hundred slaves, perhaps six hundred, had also died and they were found in a separate grave, together with some of the citizens of Plataea who had fought in the battle. The Persians had lost about 6,000 men. Many were killed. Some were taken prisoner. Others, in their panic, ran into the marshes on either side of the battlefield and drowned. The rest ordered their ships and attempted to round Cape Sunion, in the hope that they could find Athens unguarded but the Athenians' force marched back to Athens and got there ahead of the Persian fleet. They had covered the 42 kilometers of the marathon distance in full armor after fighting a battle, and by this great feat they secured a victory. The Persians sailed off. Had the Athenians lost the battle, perhaps there would have been no Pericles, no Socrates, no Plato, no Parthenon, no Athenian democracy. That was a battle that truly made a difference. <laughs>